Yeah. Uh, that uh, the second march. Yeah. At um, from seven to Montgomery. Yeah. And you were there. I was there in the hall of it. Uh, there was we we issued a call for people to come and from all over because we had to have it out. You see that if the policemen would beat the heck out of us marchers, would they beat the heck out of priests and mm -hmm. nuns and so forth? Mm -hmm. This presented one of the great dilemmas for our country at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are so many things we leave out in this, in the cell and all this stuff, but it, let's get to this anyway. And uh, so that It was determined that the march had to be done. We met at Brown Chapel and we were getting together. And I remember one night, what they call it, government relations service, men went two and three o'clock in the morning. We set up two days. Uh, they were trying to convince Dr. King and others of us that we should not march. Mm -hmm. But you see, we had all these rabbis and priests and everybody. Selma was loaded. We were, and we couldn't go back. And I remember the government people trying their best to get us. This is the federal government. Oh, yeah. Government relations says they call it. Mm -hmm. that, uh, to find any way that we could appease. I said, well, you can, we cannot appease uh, the people. Because it would look like we would be justified the power struck and beat and overwhelming these people. And even the President of the United States had to speak out again. Uh, and I believe I was in a critical decision. Martin and Ralph and me and seven more of us. When we had to finally say, we must go. Well, the, the, we had another problem. If you start out Martin, that, that march was to go to Montgomery. And this march ended right across the bridge, which brings a lot of nuances that we have to discuss. Uh, so we finally got started. The Governor Wallace uh, let us get across the bridge, you know. But as we had gotten across the bridge, and you remember we were on the side of the road that where traffic comes this way, meeting us. And uh, I don't know why it happened that way, but I do know that Wallace was setting up a confrontation where we would be in violation if we walked. Had we been on the other side of the road, it might have been different, but we had to decide, and, and all of the students, they were really disgusted, I must be honest with you. Uh -huh. And I realized some of the decisions that Dr. King, some of the problems he had, or any leader, because sometimes you have to figure on the moment what's best to do, and you can't go and discuss. Now the students want us to come back and discuss what we're gonna do, which you wouldn't have had a chance anyway. Uh -huh. If the police said to you, you're under arrest, you can't go back and Discussing the, the line stretched across the river. Uh, so I was up front, and it just so happened that the Lord would have it. I was going to be sure to be with Martin Ralph because I knew when we got across the river and faced down, I saw all those troopers were standing. They were at least, what, six or eight deep yeah. across. They were about uh, Half a mile, I guess, from the bridge. I can't remember exactly now. And when I was on the bridge, I said, well, Martin, uh, a big decision has got to be made. I said, now, you're not going to go to Montgomery to them. I said, we have to make a decision. I don't know whether you want to do what. Well, everybody, and particularly the, the students were lobbying for us to go on, when we go through the line, what? That was to sell. 
so we got up to the police. And as long as the police were buried to us, we weren't going to go out through them anyway. He wouldn't come out. All, right. All of a sudden. But no decision had been made. No decision had been made. We were going to go as far as we could go. But we, wouldn't, we couldn't march through them unless they moved out the way. All of a sudden, they moved out. They just started moving out. And I said to Martin, I hear the trap the government. The government is going to come back and get us for blocking trap on the wrong side of the highway. We'd be better off if we were on the other side. I said, you got to make up your mind now to, to go back and turn around or to try to get on the other side or something. And so when we when we finally when we finally they finally realized that uh, we, it was wrong. I think Martin also I don't think he even thought about that. Mm -hmm. And Rad Memphis said, "Well, that's I said that's it. Peer to you, they're moving out voluntarily, so we face our own Russia trap. What do you do? You make a decision, and you got to make it now. And you can't send runners back to the end of the line." You got to make it. And I think that's where we stood down and prayed. And Martin said, well, there's nothing to do to go back because we can't go through this traffic. And they were not, the troopers were not lined up to help us go through the traffic and hold the traffic back. Mm -hmm. I said, you see, they're not with us. They're not. So you have to decide what to do. It's yours to say to make, but I don't see nothing we can do now but go back or go up and then to, the governor charged us with obstructing the traffic. Ralph said the same thing. He said, well, if that's the deal, if they, if they ain't going to move the traffic over, then you can't go. But it was beautiful what we did. But we heard, I, I was uh, I was hurt and grimaced at uh, the amount of, of, uh, of disturbed people who have a lot of discord and oh, yes. of that oh, decision. And in particular the younger people. Because I can remember seeing scenes of it where you kneel to pray. And I believe you pray. It I was not rare pray. Well I pray. And and Martin was was on the knees and it was obviously trying to, you know, to really contemplate it. And I was saying to him, now you're gonna have to get up and, and just do what you have to do. You can decide for us to go in the government can talk. Go, see, while segregationists were not above anything. Okay. They could have used any little old simple traffic trick to, to throw out this march. Uh -huh. And I said, we've got to face it. Uh, you, have, if you can ask them to, to move the traffic out the way. He said, that's going to do no good. And so they and see all that traffic was behind them, as you can see the pictures. Mm -hmm. And they were at least, oh, I guess they were eight deep across that thing. So all of a sudden, without anything, they just moved on. So it's an hour and a half, what do we do? I said, I don't see nothing to do now but to go back or ask the man to help us and give us some directions. Because if we want to go to Montgomery, we got to have that protection. Mm -hmm. And they're moving on, not saying anything. Uh, it's unfortunate. And nobody came back and said anything to us. See? And that was unusual. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, nobody like. Nobody uh, from the nobody from the commander of the troopers. Mm -hmm. Nobody said anything. Nobody said anything to us. I said, now here is the trap. We are left to face the traffic. Uh -huh. And how are you going to do that? And when the troopers move themselves off, where were we? Uh -huh. And that decision right now could be debated on and on. But, but all of us know you can't walk through traffic facing traffic. Uh -huh. So the decision that he made the decision then to turn. We made it good. As you, to, as, you made, as you made that decision to turn and go back, yeah. and people started to follow you, and then there was some commotion within the ranks. Yeah, back. Younger people who were saying that. Especially those younger people 
And and you know, you can empathize with them. They had been blown up, beaten up on this very bridge. And so our when we left, we were saying we're going to Montgomery, not just going back across the bridge. It was a it was a big land, but it was the best we could do in the same situation. But uh I said to him now, Martin, we're in the danger of the governor charging us for blocking traffic. They're not going to unless they why did they move the traffic off? They could move traffic to the other side of the room. I said, now let's just look at what we say. We said that to them. Martin said, I'm afraid you're right. So they had time. I said, the government is going to sucker you. The governor is going to sucker you into getting away. He said he could not uh, defend our walking, facing the traffic. But you had you had uh, faced situations similar to that and defied the government. Yes. You know, he and Burnley have faced it with the injunctions and uh, you know, any number of things. I think if we had been on the other side of the road, I would have been. But, 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 you know, you have to look at where you are and what you are. And how you can, see, you have to justify, and with, even within your own self, what you do. You know, you live with yourself. You are a person. You are everybody. To some extent, it's a little universe in themselves. And we all have common interests, but if you're up front, you have the problem. And so every, a lot of people feel like Martin and, and, and we we go like, but I don't think anything else we could have done. Uh, I would have been glad. And you know, I asked him when we were coming up, I asked him, why, why did we come on that side of the, the street? You know, when you get across the bridge, I think you go too. Right. Yeah, and we were on this side. Facing the traffic on the left side. And traffic was back up behind them if you look at the picture. Mm -hmm. And they were eight feet. So we thought that they were going to stop us. Right. So we paused before we got to them to side to the side where we were going to mm -hmm. Well then eventually the march did take place. Well it did take place. Yeah. And um, you that was another triumph. Oh yeah, try. And, and, and of course, I think I went in two days. The day that Viola Liu who was killed, we were about halfway then, I mean, and I had met her beautifully. She was picking up people. And I met her and spoke to her. And of course, she was glad to meet me because she had heard about me. They're in cell. And, uh, I had uh, been on the road, and that, the, the day that she was killed, I was, uh, the day that she was killed, I had been there the day or two before that. Mm -hmm. We couldn't, none of us could be all the way every day. Right. Right. What was it like once the, the uh, march actually made it to Montgomery? I think it was a moment of triumph. I, I couldn't go much through the country because I had to be, other places doing other things. But I made sure to be there that the, the day when they got to this uh, Catholic institution. I think they got there that night. So I came in that night and we had a, the musicians and had some sort of a show there, benefit. And the next day we were to go on into Montgomery. And, uh, and we marched in to Montgomery. And people swell the line all the way out. I think it was it was a, it was a triumphant event as we marched in and marched up. And I still had the challenge that the, the, the idea of challenge was in me always. You know, there was a line of troopers that we couldn't go up to the capital. So my statement was that I think we ought to go all the way up to the capital, and the next time we will go up something like that. But Martin was, I think that statement about give us the ballot or something. Right. A tremendous uh, speech. Give us the ballot. Yeah. Um, I also, we didn't talk about the uh, March on Washington. Well, there were two. We had prayer pilgrimage, you remember, right. yeah. which was uh, inside in my room mm -hmm. in the motel. Okay. And it was a prayer pilgrimage. And uh, it was 
that. That, um, and then, then the, the mall. That was in March of 63. Yeah. 63, but we went to pilgrimage in, what was it, 57 or what? Yeah, it was 57. I mean, yeah, 57, 57. I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the prayer pilgrimage was the first day. Right. And, uh, people used to think that Martin was, um, and I did too for a was given to much indecision sometime at the time when you need forthright speaking. Martin was finna go off and write a book, where do we go from here or something? And uh, Phil, A. Philip Randolph and uh, uh, Rustin. Rustin was in my room, and so we were, we were talking, and actually, this is the first one. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I think we can do it. And if I'm going to be in it, we have to go ahead and do it then. So we did that in the May of 57. Right. Uh, the, the other one was came after the victory, you know, right. 63. Right, that's right. So so we, all this is yeah, yeah, we had we had won. Right. And Birmingham finished okay. well in that. Sure. That's right. Okay. Really, that seems to have been part of the victory celebration. It, it was a climax of it. And I think, uh, I think that speech, somebody asked me about it, was God trying to speak to people. I really think Kings was at his best. Uh, I don't think there'll ever be another one, however large, that would have more meaning or more symbolism or more uh, essence that people need to get them than what Annette did in uh, 1963. Then the next month, that was the Bronx 16th Street Baptist Church. Yes. The Klan <clears throat> was determined that we had a victory, but it wouldn't be a victory. And that we had a victory, but our joy would be short-lived in the sense of uh, exulting and shouting. And uh, the reaction always is possible in human lives. The satanic element that wants uh, good people and the goodness to thrive. In fact, uh, Excuse me. Sinus The whole epic of human progress is, is, is built on action and reaction. And uh, the enemies will go to any land to do it. And you see, uh, one of the problems with people who mean well is that we don't look out and watch and anticipate. I would suspect that hindsight, and maybe we wouldn't do it today, but with hindsight, we should have been prepared. The government and the officials should have been prepared for, in the wake of victory, right. that the Klan would right. just be the Klan. Right. Do what they would do. What they would do. And, and, and especially in places like uh, the motel and 16th Street Church where we had been been meeting and and, and the real place and even Bethel again mm -hmm. uh, would have been guarded and wouldn't have taken a whole lot of people to it. You know, one of the things we haven't talked about is I don't necessarily think that uh, any interview had to be so much about me, but you know, the second bundle of Bethel's churches. Is, is, is a part of history that's not much known about us. Right. That, that, uh, and that's the time. I, I don't want to get into this until you get ready. That's fine. Let's, let's, do that. let's do that. And it comes out of what I'm saying here now. Uh, that second bombing in 58, the Klan was intending to the me and you again in 57 at Philip High School. So in 58, they were determined 
if they couldn't cure me to at least blow the church down so I wouldn't have a baseball operation. And that's thinking, you know. Uh, how shall I say this? The J. Edgar Hoover in the federal government parts, portions of it have to be blamed for much of what has happened in the deep south, mm -hmm. especially here in Birmingham, including the 16th Street Park. Right. Yeah. They yeah. knew things into it. Mm -hmm. and, and there ought to be even now an investigation into it. But it so happened that uh, J.B. Stone was finally arrested 22 years after his second birth. Stoner called me and asked me would I come down and be his witness. I said, well, what can I witness? Uh, nothing but the fact that he had asked me. I said, well, no, I'll come down myself. I don't need to come down. You take me down. That's the only conversation I had. But uh, we before this judge, and, and this is... Uh, it is 22 years of justice now. And we learn in there that Stone justified to some things. This is why I think much of what's in Birmingham and happened in the Deep South, Birmingham, Mississippi, Jordan, should be reinvestigated even right now. And uh, in this courtroom that day, Mr. Stoner testified that Eugene Bull Connor and the FBI team sat in the First Baptist Church up in the, one of their offices, overlooking the lot on which Bull Connor's men and J.B. Stoner made a deal. And this came after, yeah, this is why I, I think the law wants this in history. Mm -hmm. You remember that there were 55 sticks of dynamite found in this big Jewish thing up there in uh, what you call that area? In the, um, yeah. Uh, Coming down that hill. Right. I forget the color of the name, but I can't think of it right now. All the white folk did in that. And I say God was merciful because that 55 up on Highland. Highland, yeah. If that 55 sticks of dynamite had gone off and that explosive effect had rolled down that belly, it would have slain people mm -hmm. in most of the way. Mm -hmm. God was merciful. After that blast, that's what forced, I understand, this meeting at the Clanton, and you've got to get rid of. You know, you've got to get it. This is coming home, you see, to white folks. Right. Yeah. Too close. So, this is when Bull was sitting there. And they were negotiating with Clay, with, with Stone. And his testimony was that they would pay him to bum my church, destroy it. That's why the woman said against the wall. And if I didn't get out of town after that, they were paying ten thousand dollars to get up somewhere and just kill me. And when he said that, that the judge was so shocking. All of the camera turned on me, and I'm sitting on the front row always. So I just smiled because I'd come through that twenty-two years, you know, and. Um, And of course, Mr. Mr. Man got 10 years, I believe it was, whatever it was. But this shows that officials were involved, that the FBI had knowledge of it, that my life was expendable, even to them. But look at how many failures that they made. Look at how many attempts to cow me down or kill me, get me out of it. Look how many jailings, and yet I. Out of all of it, I, I rose to the top of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here today, nearly 75 years old, never expecting to get 40 years old in this city. 
Surely God is able, and surely God's good to bring here. People need to think about that. There have been a number of uh, reports, um, even books, on 1968, which was the assassination of Dr. King and the assassination of Dr. Kennedy. Yeah. Um, and there have been some conspiracy theories, of course. Right? Yeah. What What's your reaction to, to those? Just like there was some knowledge of uh, implications of participation in the thing which I just told you about this clan thing. Right. After that pit fire stick dynamite. There was more perhaps and wider participation in governmental and police officials. You see the South Never fit for Gabe Kennedy for proposing civil rights action. And you can never know exactly what the CIA did or did not do or did not know. I do know that uh, James Earl Ray could not have gone to London and got passes and this and that and the other without somebody knowing about it. How could he get your pass? How could it get to flight? So I would not, uh, while I, I don't try to play God, never have, but I know that ordinary men can't fly and go to London and get passes and this passports and this and that. There has to be. And then I was, uh, there was a police official talking one day about uh, what happened in Memphis, that, that, they knew that Dr. King was coming, they knew that situation was heightened. And they had this on the air, I was listening at it, that this police official questioned why they had to move him off his post of duty at a certain time before Martin Luther King was killed. I don't even remember the man's name at this time. There have been, and there are still reasons, I think, to question, to look into what has happened. So to answer your question, do I think there have been at least some involvement in uh, Kennedy and King? The answer is yes. Yes, because these people would have carried this country forward in human rights before the conservative right, or whatever, by whatever name is called would have sat in and slowed down. And had Robert Kennedy been elected president, we would have been further ahead built on where, where we are. If you ask my honest impression, I think God moves in human affairs and he moves to sometimes limit things as well as sometimes to push things. And no man, however popular or however strong, will ever be God. We, we, we move into his uh, our little niche in history and do things and we go. You see, the Tower of Babel way back there was, was done as a matter of fact and nobody's going to build up the way you can get to heaven on your own. And God frustrates the efforts of men at times. So that there is always a need, and I guess I'm, I'm philosophizing, but everybody has a philosophy. Mine comes from thinking at least. There will always be a need to struggle. There will always, goodness is, is a goal, a concept, that people have to strive at. It just ain't gonna come because we aren't good at that heart, we are bad. Uh, the whole I was born in sin. And then mother and shaped in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me. But that the God of this universe, his purpose is in all generations and in many situations, not necessarily all of them. 
He proposes to do certain things that you know it had to be God. See, it had to be God to keep me out in the bunk. See, it had to be God to do certain things. And so that no man can be God. And 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 but he wants people to, it seems to me, live conscious of the fact that you can relate your life to him and have a sort of a better movement toward that goal of goodness and perfection, which is always elusive. Just like holiness. We'll be ultra holy when we see God's face. But we are holy now to the extent that we are trying to be holy. So he helps us. And I don't know whether that's out of order, but it's what I feel. Uh, he, as much as we need it, Robert kept me. And I look at it, I, I, you know, I, I rode on that, they sent me to ride on the train. And I was moved at the people who stood uh, by the railroad track. And one man got killed, as you recall. By that train. It got too close or something. The train moved on though. Mm -hmm. And I was there when his brother Terry did his unit and all. But I was requested because I had worked with him. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I saw the pathos, the sadness, the 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 the, the, the uh, sorrow at a lack of fulfillment in people. Well, there's always going to be some of that because God wants us to look up, but only he can do that. Real fulfillment. We can just do a little of it and move on. And, and uh, I think I think that if Robert had been able to be present, we would have been a little bit closer to certain goals and some of our laws would not be shaking. And, and the uh, attempt of the right way to roll back wouldn't be as quite as good as it is now. But on the other hand, I look at this God, we have nothing to have what he wants to do. And he's going to leave him uh, himself a lot to do <laughs> with our lives as we go on. And that's seen even in the school system. Uh, the institution like this where you're trying to uh, Tell people, look at yourself, look at what has happened, and uh, and think about what how what you can do better. That's that's his way. But in all of it, we're going to be helped. And finally, you we cannot will to do good without that coming first from above. Just remember that. So I'm 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 gratified that I have been used in the flesh. With, I guess, urges and unctions by the Spirit to give myself as best I could for the good. And I would never profess to be a perfect man. Mm -hmm. But I have tried to do good. It's in the Bible, trust the Lord, do good, so shall I do it. Mm -hmm. And we have to teach, if we can ever teach people these basic elementary facts and let them know that they are, after all, uh, to relate themselves to a higher being and to each other, we'd be better off. From your perspective, what does the death of Dr. Martin King mean to the movement? I have a feeling that he had done what God had for him to do at that time and moved on up high. Uh, I thought. Mine was to be cut off back there, but I understand now that it is, you know, sort of, to some degree, not, not to the degree I'd like to, try to give interpretation and encouragement. And, and, and living now in assembly, I'm all, I'm all over one of the big trees still living now. Mm -hmm. But I think Dr. King's time had come. And, and when, as I told you, I was sitting in my church choir rehearsal. I was sitting in my office in the choir of rehearsal when the word came. And my feeling initially was that he had done his best 
He learned to have that he had been used by God at least to, to speak to the nation. Now, if you hear and don't heed, then the responsibility is on you. God is never without witness. And if God's judgment comes, even David said it had to be true and righteous altogether. You suffer because you could have heard or should have heard and did not. It's the same with the nations. See, Isaiah said the nations are like a drop in the bucket. So like he did with you in the ministry, he did with nations. The SCLC, after his death, had some, some difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, how did those play out from, from your vantage point? as being, you know, a key person in the CLC in China. To the extent that I was needed and and participated in use, I was key. I, I never figured that I was key because I always referred to Martin to be the leader. And Martin, as you know, as a CKSD should have been the next president. And I think that might have been a mistake because all humans have humans have problems. Martin and Ralph were so close. I think Ralph wanted to succeed Martin. And and Martin and Ralph were so close and everything. And Ralph uh, that Martin uh, prevailed on the board because I I felt like that uh, CK Steel rightly should have been the first. And we might have gotten a slight different thing. You know, history is always before us to look back and see what might have happened. Still don't know. But Martin pleaded with the board to make Ralph the next question line. And I always uh, thought that was not the best thing. And CK still took it, and I always admired him for that because he was a movement person. Well, when Ralph got it, when Martin died, and this is not to take anything from anybody else. No man is God. But Ralph was the most insecure person that you could, you could find. Although he wanted it, there was always an insecurity about Ralph, and I don't want to explain except to say that Ralph would slip and cry <laughs> at times when he ought to have been making decisions. I mean, about simple things. That's sure enough to get into that. Ralph's idea that as president of SCLC, just being the president of SCLC would command loyalties and command progress. It would. And I give you this example so that you can see I'm not misstating it because I wouldn't do that. One day when Ralph was president and activities had died down and wasn't much being said, Ralph couldn't get a headline on it anyway. Ralph called an emergency for me to come to New York City. Always I have tried to, if more than Ralph called, I would go. So I put on everything I had and caught the next plane. They had arranged. And I went and I went taking an hour to get from the airport. Uh, the, the white man that was so close to mine, I can't think of his name. Now. Levinson, is that the one? Levinson. Levinson. Yeah. Yeah. Harold Tell and Lev Levinson. Levinson. That stand, I think it was Stanley. Yeah. There were two Negroes, I can't think of their names right now. Mm -hmm. When I walked into the room, Ralph was glad I came. And Ralph had one of these, that small paper that's so thick, Daily Wood, is it Daily News? Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was sitting in a chair. And he had his hand in. I guess they had told him I was coming up. 
And I can tell when I went in the building, the, the people there, particularly white person and one of the other Negro ones, were distressed. Some of them in the room so thick you could cut it. I said, well, Ralph, uh, here I am. What is it uh, you want? Uh, I, uh, you know, I've always come when you call. So I put my set. So he didn't say anything at first. And I looked around. And I think this young white fellow, this white man, well, the young, was distressed and he hadn't said anything. So I said, well, I'm here. So what, what is it that you need? I thought he was going to pick up some drive or something. And he, he was almost on the verge of tears. So he flipped over the page. Is he on page 97 or 107 or something like that? And he flipped over the page. No, he said, we've got to find a way to bury Martin Luther King. This is history, so. I said, how do you mean that, Rat? I said, we've got to find a way to bear a bond with the king. I said, Rat, I'm sorry to hear you say that. I don't think you should ever say that. Like when when not a bond with the king, you wouldn't be where you are today. And the black, you see those people lifting up since I'm saying these things to him. And I said, uh, so he flipped on the paper. He said, look, we the president of SCLC. I said, look, saying about that. One, one five line, think, mm -hmm. in a column, way back on page 97 or 107, something like that, way back in. Mm -hmm. He looked where the president of SCLC is. Well, I've always been straight and nice as I could. I said, well, Ralph, I said, I'm sorry to hear you say that about Martin. And don't ever say that. I say, you're on page 97 because you're not done page one action. This is what I said to you. I said, remember when when uh, we were in the uh, encampment there and you were talking about we're going to stay on the mall at camp all day. I said, you knew we couldn't do that. You should have said that and been making plans to mark, let folks march out instead of being driven out by tear gas. I said, that's what Martin would have done. And some church had offered us, as I understand. I had been, I, I went up one night, because I knew didn't want to go to the tent too much. And I had decided I was going to, if necessary, go check with Ralph and stay out there in the city if it would help to do my rap. They didn't have discipline, as you know, if we should have. And I don't, I hate to say it, but Ralph was in a motel room. And Ralph had at least 10 to 12 phones on this thing. I don't know how it was, I mean, a phone. A lot of them. And so when I walked in to talk to Ralph, let know I had come up and if he had any ideas about this and that one. Well, I was so busy that I guess he spoke less than 30 words to me. After calling you from... No, no, no. This is another thing. Oh. Now, this is this is during the tent campaign. Oh. That's, all, that's all that happened in this thing. Oh, I just told him, I don't you ever. Hmm. You, you do well, everything you had to lift up Martin's name. Yeah. Uh, there in New York, why was he in New York? This was during the tent city. No, no, I mean, Resurrection City. During, that, during the time that when he called you. This was that. after that. Okay, well, why was he in New York? I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Except that he was there. He might have been there for some. But he wanted you to come up. He they sent me for yeah. that, for that, just that little thing. And I don't know whether he had plans uh, for something to be presented to the board so we could do this and that. Mm -hmm. But Ralph felt insecure. He never felt the, the well, you know, the, the book that he wrote, the controversy that, that, that was invoked as a result of that. Uh, how yeah. did you read that? 
Well, the doctor in the room called me and I thought said I was shocked by that because I thought that he could read a better book as the nonviolent leader explaining nonviolence to people and talking about that rather than salacious situations, which everybody's done on TV and other things. And I thought it was sickening. And I thought it was uh, somebody who had uh, some book published or some person who got in with them who wanted to bring King's mood out mm -hmm. and nobody to better validate who, who better than rest. Mm -hmm. And I thought there was money involved and I understand there was. And uh, excuse me, I understand that I think Ralph thought the book would make a killing, but the book flowed as God would have. And uh, of course, uh, you know, I was in uh, Jesse Hill from Atlanta Life. The bishop and several of us who went up to Washington and made a statement that we had hoped and prayed that such wouldn't be. But that Bernard had said he was there that night, you know. And of course, my statement was that I was sorry that such a thing had to be in I And that you must understand the rap didn't move long after that. And I, uh, if I've had anything that distressed me deeply, it was uh, Ralph on National News trying to justify the book. And what he said was, and I listened to this, Martin wasn't no saint. Well, nobody's a saint. And what is a saint but a sinner saved by grace and trying to live right? And I thought, and they just really did him so bad. And I really think that was part of the scope. I, I think it was such an utter medicinal favor, and yet it might be poetic justice. Nobody had done more for Ralph. Ralph's name would not have been in history except for Mark. And Ralph got into a situation in Montgomery. The first time Mark went to jail was because of Ralph's problem there in Montgomery, as I understand. So I, 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 uh, I thought the book was a terrible thing. Uh, I would have wished it. He would have said something to young people and explained some of the things, some things I've tried to say in this uh, interview. He explained about how God kept us through and brought us even on the Mississippi Road. Did you know, and I don't want to go back into it, but on the Mississippi March, you know what white men were marching or were driving around there with guns in their, their, their thing. And, and on one situation, I just say this, and Ralph could have made this real to folks. Uh, Ralph and Martin were there, and I always took the front position when, like when we were there, like we were in Montgomery when we integrated. The man to come up and struck Martin, I was right there to keep him from striking him again. But on this road, Mississippi Road, uh, one guy, they were building the highway, and he had gotten off the highway. This was a road that we were on beside now. And he just, in a truck, bore down on us. And looked like we were going. So I didn't jump out the way. And, and I saw Martin look up with that look of resignation in his. And he said, well, if he's going to kill us, ain't nothing we can do. So he didn't try to jump out the way, neither did I. And the truck came, I guess, as close to my leg, because I was a point man. As this, it slid on break. Yeah. Then he put in the voice, backed away, went on. Intimidation. We didn't know. So we were in God's hand, and you're still in God's hand. And I think there were so many things a book could point out to people and make people realize that we got somebody to help us live this life, as bad as it is, or whatever. Reverend, you have spent two days with me <laughs> telling me everything. I'm tired you out from listening. And uh, no, but you you are obviously 
as you come in town, what I'm going to do is go back and, and listen to the Okay. And I'm sure there are going to be questions that I'll have. So as you come in town periodically, what I'd like to do is sit down and maybe take an hour with you. That'd be fun. And, and, and sort of concretize what we've done here. Concretize and draw the questions will be raised, even though this about other things. You know, for instance, I could uh, tell you about incidents like St. Augustine, Florida, how we integrated the thing. Uh, how uh, Sheriff Holtz produced in St. Augustine, Florida. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, the State of the Union, you know. Right. It's all the singles. Yeah. And the flea market is there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of this. Mm -hmm. Danville, Virginia. Right. I've been a lot of places. And I'd be glad to talk with you any time. And I appreciate your design. And I hope it benefits the program of the history. I like for for people, both white and black, to know what the struggle has been thus far. And I've made people inspired. You know, it's an amazing thing, but uh, you'd be surprised how when people sit down and listen to you, it helps them. Sometimes when they don't have courage, it helps them a little bit. Uh, and I've had white people come to my office and tear down and say, I'm going to be a better man. Look at all See, I got all packs around my wall. I don't even have room. Keys of all kinds. But that to me is uh, small stuff. I'm looking for my name to be on the road in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we all better look That's for. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Very well, thank you.